that time working on the Hudson River and aspects of its uh, shorelines, of its aquatic vegetation, uh, of uh, basically the overall health of the river as a functioning ecosystem, and has been particularly interested in uh, the effects of flooding, these recent floods uh, on the river ecology there. Stuart Finland. Thanks, Bill, and thanks to uh, Carolyn and everyone that helped put this program together. Um, I think there is tremendous interest uh, in this topic, and there's no way that anyone can cover it all today, so paying attention to the future uh, lineup of these sorts of sessions I think will be very beneficial. Um, also, like most of you, I got up this morning and saw the sunshine and the weeds in the garden, and I thought, well, you know, I could call in sick. <laughs> And then, as you probably know, Bill's my boss and uh, remembers when you do things like that. And if you've ever been on Carolyn's bad side, um, you know you don't want to spend a whole lot of time there. So here I am, and here you are. And so what we're going to talk about today is the effects of floods, both sort of medium uh, and large, uh, on stream ecosystems. And I'll cover uh, a variety of things. Um, to, to make just a few sort of central points, and I'll summarize these again um, at the end. But one of the take home messages is that these streams have seen lots of floods in their sort of lifespan, um, and they're more or less a normal and recurring event for the streams. Uh, secondly, there are different time scales of responses of the streams uh, to these sorts of floods, and the physical alterations in the stream channels. Um, and some of their morphological aspects, those effects last quite a long time and are evident for quite a long time. For a lot of the biota, uh, the things that live in there, everything from the algae on the rocks uh, up to the fish, they've evolved um, again over these long time spans and have, uh, you know, as a species, have seen many of these floods. And so they're, they're kind of used to it. You know, individuals may suffer, but the, the populations uh, persist. And I'll also talk about the connection um, between streams and their both floodplains and, and watersheds. Everyone knows that during floods, streams become connected to their floodplains, which is often not a good thing if you happen to either live or have some sort of structure in the floodplain. Uh, but again, this is sort of a normal aspect um, that occurs frequently in the lifespan of a, of a stream, not necessarily frequently in our lifespan although perhaps more so. So streams in this region have been, you know, in their current location, give or take, some, some more uh, stable than others, for tens of thousands of years. You know, glaciers left on the order of 10,000 years ago, not quite, but about that time scale. And so we've been talking about this 100-year flood event, uh, and when you put it in that perspective for what a stream, a particular stream bed uh, channel has, has experienced, you know, they've seen about 100, 100 year uh, events. So again, uh, to them, this is sort of a normal uh, occurrence. Uh, give you some perspective, probably most of you will pay federal income taxes about 50 times in your lifespan. It's not something you look forward to. Um, I hope you do it. Um, but it's not, uh, you know, catastrophic. I hope it's not catastrophic for you. And so from a, you know, your point of view and a stream point of view, something you experience 50 to 100 times in your life becomes sort of a, a normal, or perhaps not something to look forward to, uh, but it's sort of a normal uh, event. So streams have, have uh, sort of come to adapt their, their channels and their physical structures uh, to deal with these long time spans. Uh, the particular stream shown here is in New Hampshire. Uh, you see the very large rocks. Uh, this stream uh, will never flood to the extent that it can move those rocks around. Those rocks were left by glaciers. Uh, and so again, the stream is sort of doing what it does in a very long time span uh, context. And it's important to look at it that way. We tend to look at floods in a very short, short term. Uh, the response is often done in a short term. Occasionally it's done without uh, sufficient forethought. Um, but the stream itself has, has been through many of these events at any given time, um, and we'll see more of them. So uh, there's an image that's not showing up. There it goes. 
So right now and right here, we're worried about increased flows, incre increased likelihood of uh, flooding, increased precipitation, as we just heard uh, from Jessica. Globally, the big issue in stream and river ecology is actually decreasing flows or increased regulation of those flows. So the, the spiky looking graph on your left shows a classic example of regulation of river flow. This is the Colorado River uh, mean annual flow, or, da or daily flow, I think it is, uh, before and after the Glen Canyon Dam was closed. And obviously, before the dam was constructed, the river fluctuated wildly every year, you know, huge variations in flow, and probably had done so for tens of thousands of years. After the Glen Canyon Dam, all those peaks are, are taken off, all that water is stored in the Glen Canyon Dam and released over a more regular interval. So huge differences in the amount of flow passing down the, the Colorado River uh, with big consequences for the, for the biota. Uh, again, most of that biota had adapted, had, had evolved uh, to tolerate these sorts of fluctuations and all of a sudden the variability goes away. And so there have been big changes globally. Uh, the, the figure in the upper right, the color coding, the red basins uh, have had what the authors consider severe uh, regulation or removal of flows. Uh, so most of the rivers uh, across Europe, um, Southeast Asia, uh, obviously the U.S. have had severe, what they categorize as severe regulation or uh, reduction in flows. Um, and so again, across the, the globe, you know, most of the big rivers have had big changes in their flow regime. We're particularly interested here uh, in flooding, and I'll talk about that in a second, but you have to realize from a global perspective, the really big picture, uh, flattening out of the flows is actually a bigger problem, or reduction in flows is actually a bigger problem uh, than floods. The, the photo at the bottom is, is fairly well known. It was in National Geographic a few months ago, and this is the mighty Colorado River before it reaches um, the ocean, and it's not quite so mighty looking by that point because of the amount of water that's been removed for human uses. So this globally is a common issue, although we're not so worried about it here. Part of the reason we're not worried about it here is we are very lucky in that we have adequate fresh water uh, to meet most of our normal needs. There are relatively few places, um, certainly not since about 1964, that have suffered severe uh, water restrictions. There are issues with water quality, uh, by and large, there are issues with water quantity. Now, we all know as soon as I said that, I've triggered about a 50-year drought that's going to strike us uh, this summer. So if that happens, forget that I ever said any of this. But in general, you know, looking again at the big picture, you know, we do have adequate water, and there's actually increases in the flows. Jessa talked about increases in precipitation. This shows up locally. The plot on the left with the blue dots is the Wappinger Creek as measured at Red Oaks Mill, uh, just downstream from here. About a 20% increase uh, in flow over the last 100 years, so more water passing that point uh, than used to be the case. Uh, the two panels on the right are the Hudson River. This is the amount of flow measured uh, at Green Island Dam, just north of Albany. Uh, the top panel, um, uh, statistically, and if you, if you study it for a while, that's the mean annual flow. So on a, a, a mean per year basis, the flow has increased more than is true for the summer. Uh, those are the data shown in the bottom panel. And this is in perfect alignment with the sort of changes in precipitation that Jessica was talking about. The summertime is not necessarily when we're getting more uh, precipitation. It's happening at other times of the year. So the slope, when you look at sort of the mean annual uh, way, is steeper than just for the summer. So more water coming down the Hudson uh, at times other than the summer. This has big effects on the biota uh, of the Hudson, and we can talk about it break if you want to get into that. But locally, we're lucky. We have quite a lot of water. It looks like we're getting more water. That's good from a water supply point of view. Um, it does mean that floods are likely to be a little more uh, severe. So again, this is, a, this is just uh, reinforcing the point I just made about our local uh, stream, uh, the Wapenters Creek. Uh, uh, we're obviously sitting in the Wapenters drainage uh, right now. Uh, if you take that 100-year record and take the mean for the first 25 years 
uh, was 240 cubic feet per second. The last 25 years is 292 cubic feet per second. So about a 20% increase in flow looked at as an annual average uh, comparing the first and last 25 years uh, of the record. So there's more water in the stream. So even if precipitation did not increase, and Jessica told us it's going to, and I think that's correct, even if precipitation did not increase, the sort of base level is a little bit higher, you're likely to get uh, more flooding, uh, even if there weren't a big change in, in precipitation. So we're sort of set up, we're lucky in that we have lots of water, but it does mean that the, the consequences of some of these events may be uh, a little more extreme. So what's causing uh, the higher flow? There are three uh, good candidates. I don't think they're all in operation uh, here in this basin. Um, the one that you've already heard about is there is more precipitation um, uh, and possibly more intensity. And both of these will tend to give you more flow in, in the channel. Uh, more precipitation means simply there's more water falling on the watershed. It has to go somewhere. It's not allowed to just disappear. Um, and so some of that will show up as flow in the channel. And, and as Jessica said, this has happened. There's, there's good data that it has happened and will probably continue to happen. The intensity also matters. Uh, very intense uh, rain events don't have the opportunity to infiltrate as quickly. You saturate that surface layer of soil and you get runoff. Shows up in the, drain, in the channel more quickly um, and moves downstream and will be evident as more flow down the stream. The, the fact that the water flow down the Hudson River has gone up means there's got to be uh, some fairly large scale changes that have occurred because the Hudson Basin uh, is quite large. Uh, most of it is forested. And um, there, there are questions when this sort of change in flow are observed in forested basins as to just what's, what's going on. So it is also experiencing more precipitation. That's part of it. But the other thing that's possible for some of these forested basins is the, the amount of vegetation, um, the activity of that vegetation may actually be declining. So many of the forests, probably not true right here in Dutchess County, but many of the forests throughout the basin are probably reaching their sort of you know, peak age. Therefore, they're not growing as quickly. They're not transpiring as much water. So that's, that way that water would otherwise leave the basin is not operating as effectively. There's more water left over uh, to pass down the channels. So the fact that we see this sort of change in the, in the, uh, the very large scale, the scale of the Hudson uh, drainage, means that something big that's also operating at, you know, in the forested parts of the catchment uh, are probably also contributing to this increased flow. Uh, locally, again, land use uh, will certainly affect flow. Uh, the figure at the bottom shows that for a particular rain event, if you were to look at the water passing a point, uh, exiting either a, a watershed that had a lot of urban uh, growth in it, might have a lot of impervious surface, the flow will be uh, more peaked. Uh, it will reach a higher level. It will come up more quickly, probably also decline more quickly. Um, but again, the fact that that water is delivered to the channel faster than in a forested basin where it might uh, sink into the ground a little more effectively, might be transpired. Um, in that urban situation, the, again, the background flow will be higher. The actual stage, the, the depth of water in the channels will be greater. The force of that water will be greater because it's moving through more quickly. And so you're going to have a, a more extreme flood in an urban setting than a forested setting, even if the actual precipitation event uh, were identical. That could be part of what it will happen locally uh, in Dutchess County. It doesn't affect the sort of big regional patterns uh, because there aren't you know, huge increases in impervious cover in the Adirondacks, uh, for example, and probably won't be in the near future. So I talked about the, the, the time scale of the uh, physical, physical uh, effects of these high flows. And the, the point of this diagram is to highlight for you sort of the nature of the stream channel um, under different flow conditions. And the, the, the size of the stream channel, how big this cross section is, uh, this is set by the really high flow events. So the really extreme flows are what sort of erode and, and form uh, that channel. So in, in any given channel, and you can go almost anywhere and see this sort of physical structure, 
there will be uh, some, probably some evidence of a cut bank, and this will be where it has been eroded during really high events. There may well be uh, a floodplain that's obvious for, through one mechanism or another. There may be secondary channels, but at high flows, the water occupies all this area and forms that channel. Those high flows obviously don't happen very often, uh, but the, the legacy, the physical structure imposed by those high flows is evident in the stream forever. Most of the time when you go out and look at the stream, so today, and probably for the next few weeks, what you'll see is the water is occupying a tiny fraction of that channel. Um, and um, the water in the channel is fed by base flow, which is largely groundwater uh, input. So the, the, the structure of the channel, that physical structure of the channel is set by these high flow events, but most of the time the stream simply doesn't have, uh, you know, when it's, when it's at this sort of level, it doesn't have the, the, the capacity uh, to markedly change um, uh, the, the structure you see here. So this is pretty generally true, and you can see it almost anywhere. It's a little harder when the vegetation is out, as is the case today. But this general structure is true, uh, and again, it's set by the high flows. You have to real life um, and try and look for these sorts of things, and at first glance, it can be a little bit diff difficult. Uh, this is the Taliamento River uh, in Italy. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful example of sort of spatial heterogeneity and how different rivers can look. But you can actually get down to ground level and you can identify, you know, the main channel is here. You can recognize it by the turbidity. Uh, all these side channels are here. There are structures that, you know, have persisted since the last flood. They now have trees on them. So they're at least, you know, 40 years old that allow trees to, to, to grow up. But they're in the floodplain. So the next really, really big flow is going to sort of clean the slate. Uh, and take all these structures out. And again, this river has been here um, for quite a long time and has been through these cycles of sort of reforming this channel, the high flows of reforming this channel uh, many, many times. So again, a normal set of processes uh, occurring for these sorts of, of systems. Another um, effect of high flows that gets a lot of talk um, in this area is the, is the role of wood uh, in streams. This is a section of the east branch of the Wappingers Creek, which is literally right over the hill here. And these trees came down in an ice storm. Um, the trees weren't carried in by a flood. But these trees came into this stream uh, during an ice storm. And it's probably one of the few times in the last couple hundred years that there was significant wood in the streams. Most of the streams around here would normally have had quite a lot of wood in them. And because of land use change and some you know, active clearing of the channels, uh, that would have been, uh, that wood would have been removed. I think that's right. Um, so at the time the wood is in the stream, it's serving as habitat, it's helping to retain organic matter, it's modifying the flow to some extent, it's changing where the pools and ripples uh, in the stream are. And again, it's, it's the, it, you know, the, the physical nature of the stream, the, the fairly long time scale to response to, to events such as this, having the wood dumped into the stream. The stream has the power to move that wood. Uh, so big events will move that wood. And it's a little tricky to see here because of the shadows. But that wood is now, through a high flow event, been moved over to the channel. The stream has simply had the power uh, through a particular high flow event that it could swing that wood out of the channel and restore the flow uh, moving down the channel. The wood is now serving a different purpose. It's protecting the banks to some extent. It still has habitat value, um, that sort of thing. But the stream has had the power to move that wood. The wood will sit over here for a long, long time, you know, past most of our lifetimes, I suspect. Because once it's sort of out of the main channel, it's not going anywhere, and it's going to take a long time to decompose. So again, Streams do have these long time spans uh, where their physical structure is, is, uh, is, is modified by these high flow events. So to a, to a stream, you know, floods are sort of you know, relatively frequent events given the, the longevity of the, of the system itself. Okay, um, another thing that happens uh, during flooding events is that the uh, connection to the surroundings, and I'll talk first about the floodplain uh, itself. When streams come up, obviously there's more connection to what we define as the floodplain, that either you know, we could go out and fairly uh, reliably define a floodplain, and obviously for insurance, 
purposes, FEMA defines uh, floodplain. But when the rivers come up, um, this is when there's opportunity for organisms to move back and forth uh, onto the floodplain and for materials such as debris, and I'll talk about that in a second, to move back and forth uh, onto the floodplain. This is um, a photograph of the floodplain of the Amazon River, which is sort of the poster child for the importance of this sort of rising and falling water and pathways for animals to move back and forth. Those water levels rise and fall by you know, tens of meters, you know, 30, 40 feet, very reliably every year, completely normal and necessary part of how the system works. Um, and this, the, the fact that this water is on the floodplain, there's a whole suite of fishes and other organisms that rely on that high water so they can get out on the floodplain, they feed, uh, they change their feeding habitats, they spawn, they reproduce, all this sort of thing. So again, for many, many rivers, many, many systems, this, this flooding uh, and the opportunity for organisms to get out onto the floodplain and move back and forth is, is very, very important. And so again, from a global perspective, when we regulate um, these sorts of systems and cut off that flooding, uh, you really put a crimp on the opportunity for many of these organisms and animals to, to move back and forth on the floodplain. The same sort of thing at a very different scale happens locally. Uh, many of the floodplain pools are important uh, to uh, amphibian reproduction in this area um, and you know that temporary filling of water on those floodplains that might come about during spring floods is important. So cutting off the, the access of water and organisms to the floodplain is relevant here. Doesn't quite have the grandeur of the Amazon, uh, but we'll have to live with what we have. So animals and a variety of other organisms are very important to enable them to move back and forth onto the floodplain. Um, the other thing that happens is debris moves. I spoke about the logs uh, a few minutes ago. There's a fair amount of what I'll call debris, and I don't intend to be derogatory about it, uh, but debris that moves back and forth onto the floodplain, sticks, leaf litter, fair amount of garbage, um, moves back and forth onto the floodplain. And as those floodwaters come up, they're, whatever they're carrying moves out, uh, the, the waters move out over the floodplain. Once the water gets out of the channel, the velocity slows down, and whatever they're carrying, some of what they're carrying is deposited on the floodplain. It can be silts and sediments. Uh, this is, of course, why floodplain soils are so good for agricultural purposes, because they're enriched during this flooding event. Uh, there's, there's material such as is shown here, sticks and leaves. It's a source of organic matter. It's a micro habitat for a variety of organisms. It's a place for things to hide. Um, so this sort of thing, again, is quite common. It's quite natural, uh, probably beneficial for a whole variety of things. There's a tendency to look at a situation like this and say, you know, it's a mess, we've got to clean it up. Uh, that's probably the wrong way to look at it. It's actually serving a function and probably not causing a great deal of harm, uh, except in certain situations, which I'm sure we'll hear about when we talk about roads and other types uh, of, of in infrastructure. But by and large, sort of untidiness is not necessarily a bad thing. Some of you have seen my office, so you know I take this message to heart. Um, but it works for me. <laughs> so um, the, the one thing I'm going to talk about that's probably least uh, familiar and perhaps hardest to sort of you know get the concept across is the idea that flooding is the time uh, when streams are best connected to their watersheds. Now, probably everybody in this room recognizes that. You know, what you see in the stream channel, what's happening in the stream channel is very much affected by the watershed that stream is draining. Uh, whether it's forested, developed, flat, steep, type of rock, type of soils, all that sort of thing. So the stream reflects the watershed. And what's become obvious from some really fairly recent work is that that connection to the watershed, and to those soils, for instance, is much stronger as both larger and more sort of intimate during wet conditions than dry conditions. So what this image is showing, or trying to show, uh, the black line here, this is our stream channel coming out of the watershed. Uh, the red line is sort of the extent of watershed influence during dry times. And the blue line is the extent of watershed during wet times. And the, the distinction here is that during dry times, the soils further out don't have enough water that is actually moving towards the stream. 
they're not contributing water or any of the materials, chemicals in that water, they're not contributing to stream flow during dry times. During wet times, that sort of boundary moves out. So now all of this area is contributing water and whatever that water is carrying to the stream. And this is happening below the ground, by and large. Um, having water running over the surface of soils happens, doesn't happen very often. Most of the water coming in is occurring subsurface. So you have to realize that if there are things out here, natural or unnatural, if there are different types of soils that have different chemistry, if you have septic systems or not septic systems, uh, waste dumps or not waste dumps in one of these areas versus another, during wet times, this bigger area is contributing to the stream flow. During dry times, the smaller area is contributing. So again, during wet times, more intimately connected to the watershed, particularly to the soils. The other thing that happens uh, during wetter times is that the depth of the soil that the water is moving through and interacting with changes. So during relatively dry times, the surface soil is dry, so if you go home this afternoon and dig a hole, if you want to, uh, the surface soil is pretty dry and pretty hard. You get down to some depth, and that's where there will be water, and that water at depth is moving towards the stream. During wetter times, the, the soil column, the depth of soil, becomes wet all the way up, possibly all the way to the surface, so that's not quite so common, but higher up. And these surface layers are now seeing water moving through them, and that water is contributing uh, to, the, to the stream flow. So if there are things in these soils, and I've given a little darker color here because there's more organic matter, for instance, in the surface soil, there may be other chemicals, and I'll talk about one example in a second. Um, if there are different things in those surface soils, then during wet times, they're more likely to be moving down towards the stream. So again, the, the, the point of this, uh, trying to highlight the connections to the watershed, is that it's a bigger area in wet conditions, and different parts of the soil are contributing to what's going on in the stream during water, uh, during wetter uh, conditions. So str more strongly connected to what's going on in the watershed during wet times. And here's an example. This is, uh, the, these are chloride measurements done in the stream uh, just over the, the hill here, and they were done this past spring. And what the, what the figure shows, the blue line is the depth of water in the stream. There was a rain event that we saw coming uh, March 11th, so we got started sampling ahead of that. So the stream is at some low flow. It starts raining, and the stream starts getting deeper, not surprisingly. Uh, got a fair amount deeper during this event. The red dots here are chloride, and this chloride, it, it, it's another story, but it's from road salt, uh, ultimately. So it's a non-point source that's distributed around the, the watershed. So, it, but it's a, it's a soluble material that's present in the watershed. And what you see is, is, is once some of the, the, the water starts showing up in the stream, relatively small changes in, in height, you know, little bits of that rainwater starting to show up in the stream, the chloride concentrations go up. Right. So what that says is that first bit of rain, that first, I'll, I'll say, maybe day or so uh, of rain, is bringing materials from the watershed quickly into the stream. And rather than diluting a source of pollution, it's actually making those concentrations go up. You can do the little thought experiment. Suppose there were a pipe where I were putting salt into the stream at a constant rate every day throughout the year. If there were more water in the stream during, during a rain event, those concentrations would go down because there's more water diluting the salt that I'm putting in. The fact that it's behaving very differently is that there, there, be, there gets to be more and more water in the stream. The concentrations go up. I mean, again, you've got this more effective transport of things from the watershed into the stream during the first phases of this event. Once the stream really gets up there, and there's a lot more water, then you get the sort of dilution effect, which you would, have, would have, you would expect. But it's that sort of first flush, that water bringing in that first flush of materials. You can see it for chloride, you can see it for, for other uh, constituents. But again, it's this connection to the watershed point I'm trying to make. So flooding and wet conditions uh, do things to the stream. We, we can have a debate whether this is good, bad, and we can talk about different constituents and whether good, bad. But it happens. That's the point. So I'll spend the last uh, five minutes or so talking about the, the biota because probably most people care about you know, what's happening to the organisms in the streams. 
during these, these big events. And as I alluded to uh, at the very beginning, you know, these streams have been in place for 10,000 years. There have been organisms living in streams here or elsewhere uh, for much, much longer periods of time. Uh, they have adapted, uh, you know, as a species, not as individuals, but as a species. Uh, they've experienced many, many floods of, of varying degrees uh, of severity. Um, so they, they're, they're smart. Many of them are smart. We don't think of little insects and things are smart. But they figured out um, how to survive these events. Uh, this is another picture uh, of Irene, and you can imagine being a small organism um, in the, this, this is the Mohawk River. You know, it'd be a much more pleasant place to live this day than the day after, uh, as you might imagine. So, so floods do have uh, consequences, but the, the point I'll make with the next couple of images is that most of the biota recovers fairly quickly. They either tolerate the conditions or they recover fairly quickly. So these are data that show stream algae, uh, the algae of the little plants um, on the rocks. You see them as green filaments in the streams. They make the rocks slippery so you fall down when you're fishing and that sort of thing. Um, they're also important primary producers, not just uh, a nuisance. These are data from uh, a stream in Arizona. Um, the, the desert streams are prone to flash floods. It's so really extreme floods. Uh, they go from very low flow to extremely high flow uh, very quickly. Um, the stream algae, uh, they don't tolerate that very quickly. Uh, this is the, uh, the, essentially the coverage of how much algae is present in the stream. Here's where the flood occurs, where things are going along sort of 40% cover by uh, uh, diatoms, for example. Flood occurs, knocks them back to zero. So these floods have big effects on algae, uh, knock, the, knock the abundance uh, way down. But they recover very quickly. All right? There are enough either residual algae, algae from upstream, other places, that the recovery in this particular uh, case uh, is quite rapid. So floods have big and negative effect on things like um, uh, algae and, and different taxa respond uh, in different ways. So they have big effects, but recovery is fast. So uh, we, we think of this. Uh, fast recovery is one sort of ecological strategy for the, the various species of algae to be able to persist in these streams for, for thousands of years. A flood is bad for the individuals, not so bad for the species. Uh, for, for bugs, uh, I know we have at least a few uh, trout fishermen in, in the audience in the stream. Insects, uh, are, uh, people care about them because they want to use them to catch the fish that they really care about. But there are a whole variety of, of invertebrates uh, that live, at stream, live in streams, and there was a fairly recent uh, nice uh, sort of review article that looked at how big are flood effects on various types uh, of invertebrates. And there are a lot of tacks across the bottom. It doesn't much matter. I've, I've picked out some of the major groups up top here. But this axis over here is the easier one to look at. It's the percent reduction before and after uh, a flood. So the 50 line right there would be a 50% reduction in numbers of insects. Most of these are insects uh, before versus after uh, a flood. So floods are not good in the short term for insects. They get carried downstream. They get rolled over by stones, uh, things like that. Uh, but it's not decimating to their populations either. There are a variety of these taxa. Uh, there's a particular stone fly here, I won't try to line it up, a particular stone fly there, a uh, particular uh, fly, true fly here, one of the caddis flies. The reduction is, you know, under 50% during these events. And these, there are enough of these insects that, again, they can reproduce, recover next year uh, without any major effects on the population. So, again, the, the, these taxa have evolved under conditions uh, where floods, they, you know, the species has seen many, many floods. There are a bunch of behavioral things they do, uh, both when they're in the stream and when they're um, as adults, reproductive adults, uh, that allow them to compensate for this, this disturbance that goes on in their lifespan. So floods are not good for the individuals, not, not uh, terribly detrimental to the species. So um, look, looking forward and thinking about you know, the rest of today, other, other sessions you might go to, or, or how you go home and make decisions in your town or, or, or backyard, I think, you know, you've gotten the point already, um, and, you know, it's, it's going to become more and more evident that planning for flooding 
Uh, you know, it's a new game out there. The rules have changed. The playing field has changed. Uh, so you have to change what you're planning for. You have to change for the magnitude. You have to change for the timing. Uh, you probably have to change what you're willing to tolerate. Uh, and, you know, frankly, you might as well, you know, start as soon as possible uh, changing your thinking about some of those things. The flooding in these systems sets the physical template. Uh, there is a tendency for humans to get in and, and think they can design things better uh, than happens in nature. Uh, there are times when we have to try and over-engineer nature. I would argue those are fairly rare and to be avoided and only to be undertaken under you know, really clear conditions that it's necessary. By and large, it's, it's better to be adaptive rather than trying to uh, construct your way out of problems. Uh, flooding for these systems um, is not a, a complete disaster. You know, if your house gets washed away, your wastewater treatment plant gets washed away, I think that counts as a disaster. For most of the ecological processes in the biota and the streams, these floods are not a disaster. Uh, again, the species will have seen many of them um, uh, over their, their, their evolutionary time spans. And um, again, from a, from a stream ecosystem point of view, this sort of connection to the floodplain and connection um, to, to the watershed, uh, it, part of the way streams work is by having these variable connections as flow changes up and down. And, and trying to regulate that or control that too tightly is probably not going to be beneficial in the long run. So with that, I will stop and take questions depending upon the whim of our timekeeper. The question is whether the Housatonic would show the other changes in the flow. Uh, it has quite different characteristics because the, there's a lot of bedrock in that channel. Um, and so I think compared to these largely till, the, the, you know, what you're seeing at the Wappinger is this largely glacial till, which I think is not quite so true of the Housatonic, at least the stretches I'm familiar with. Uh, so probably different with it. I'm sure there are data on whether the flow has changed. Um, I haven't looked at those particularly. Maybe someone else can speak to that. I'd be a little surprised if they haven't, but there's also a, a, you know, a big hydropower dam on the Houston We regulate. John? I'm just curious, though, uh, like on Fisher Creek, we see a lot of development along the creek, and there's been a lot more discharge of water into the creek, and undercutting some of the banks, obviously large streets, sort of ready for them. In your opinion, will the creek over time actually repair itself? Yeah, so it will accommodate that increased flow. And in the case of the fish kill, and it's very probably true for the Wappingers as well, you see development, it's not as though the entire watershed has been paved over. We tend to, to, to get a little carried away thinking of development taking over the whole watershed. Most of Dutchess County is forested. And the amount of forest is actually getting bigger, not smaller. Uh, so you have to ask, where is that local water coming from? Is it simply coming out of the creek one point and going back in another? Um, if there is, you know, paving and things like that right by the creek, it's going to increase the speed that local water gets in. And again, that higher velocity is going to be more erosive. So it does take some looking at, uh, but the general, I guess my point would be the general principles of what's going on are probably understood and can be applied in a site-specific way to, to try and deal with any particular issues. Oh, that's the that's Cohoes Falls on the Mohawk River. Then was that a natural? It's natural, yeah. And then um, when you talked about uh, the large impact caused for the resource of the country, do you have any idea especially on um, what impact the excessive deer browsing, which reduces forest diversity, yeah. might have on the waterfront? So the question is, and I'm going to dance around on this, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be obvious sooner or later. Uh, the question is whether deer browsing would affect the amount of water that's delivered uh, to the Hudson. My suspicion is not. Deer browsing certainly changes the, the structure and the composition of the forest. If it's going to affect water yield, it would have to affect how much transpiration is going up out of that particular forest. 
So my suspicion would be that the total amount of water being transpired by those trees doesn't change. Although, you know, which trees are doing it, which branches are doing it, uh, is probably very different. But the total amount, I suspect, hasn't changed. No use of the word suspect. <laughs> In the previous presentation, you were talking about changing the salt front. How, how close the salt front goes up in whatever, a certain distance, where are the big breeding grounds that we threaten by changing the bracket? Yeah, so the, the question about the location of the salt front in the, in the Hudson, this is one of the big unknowns of the Hudson. So we know there's more precipitation, which is going to push the salt front out down to the city. We know sea levels rise, and we should intend to push it up. Um, I haven't heard anyone uh, categorically say they know which way it's going uh, to go. Uh, we know historically where it's been as, as flow down the river changes. You know, there are good long-term data on where that salt front has been. So if you tell me categorically the flow will change in this way, I will tell you where the salt front's going to be. No one is prepared to tell me, you know, what the flow regime for the future is going to look like, particularly given sea level, sea level rise. So there will probably be changes in, for instance, vegetation in the wetlands, where the fishes are spawning. But where that's going to be and how big that effect is, it, it's frankly just an unknown. Over here. Yeah, I'm curious about the Yeah, so, so there are a couple of different ways um, it, it's quantified. The question is, how do you know where those boundaries are? I drew the little red and blue lines. The question is, how do you know where those boundaries are? To a large extent, it's done through modeling. Um, so they're, they're pretty good watershed scale models that will say, with this amount of stream, with, with this amount of stream flow, this wetness conditions in the soils, you know how deep the soils are, you know how conductive the soils are. Uh, you can model where the water is coming from. There are also various tracers uh, that can be used, naturally occurring tracers. So if you see certain elements show up, you know where they're coming from in the watershed. Um, for one of the, the, the clearest ways you can do this, and if you watch your local stream, you can probably see this. The color of a stream is, is darker if there's more carbon, there's all the organic carbon in the stream. And if you look soon after a rain event, you may see the stream is darker. And that's because that water is moving through, the, through those more organic surface soil layers. And you can see that the stream will darken up for a bit and then go back to sort of clearer, lighter, lighter color. Uh, so that's pretty free, frequent. So you can tell sort of by the composition of water, modeling, and, and some other tracer approaches. No, color like tea. Color like tea. In the back. Temperatures in the streams increasing, and does that have an impact on the kinds of populations that you see? Yeah, so for our record right here, it's only about 20 years, so we don't see a temperature increase. Um, in the Hudson, the, the Poughkeepsie water intake has been recording temperature for 110, 120 years, and there's no observable change in temperature in that Poughkeepsie water intake. So one of, the, one of the tricky things about this climate change, air temperature has increased, but there's going to be a lag before it shows up in some of these other parts of the system. It's hard to heat water up. All right, and so you're going to get a lag in, in the system. So far, we haven't seen it in that record. I think sooner or later, there, there's not much question that's going to happen, but it's not terribly evident quite yet. Uh, well, cleaning streams won't prevent future flooding. <laughs> that's, that's the first thing. And there are times when you will wind up with debris backed up against something that you don't want debris backed up against. And so it, it can be done and will have to be done judiciously. But to, you know, I think we've all seen cases where you know we're in here, we might as well do the whole thing type, 
type attitude, and, and it's probably not going to help. It's probably expensive. Um, and so doing it judiciously with a very particular goal 